for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. George Post, Mr. Dollar. Did you have a good trip? Oh, yeah, a fine flight. It's good to change that New England weather for your Arizona sunshine. I uh, hope you feel that way after we've talked over this case. How much did they tell you in Hartford? Well, my getting out here in a hurry seemed to be more important than details. So all I know about the robbery is what broke in the papers. A $100,000 payroll stolen and two guards killed. Those are the basic points. The police have got no place with it in two days. But if you're willing to take one of the biggest gambles of your life, we may be able to crack it. We'll return to our program in just a few moments. But first, someone once said, necessity is the mother of invention. In other words, every inventor feels that there is a definite need for whatever he invents. It may be as large as a battleship or as small as a pin. But someone, somewhere, will find a use for it. And just to make sure that no one tries to cash in on his invention, every inventor carefully takes out a patent or copyright on whatever it is that he has invented. Where does he go to get his patents or copyrights? Probably to the Department of Commerce, since that is the prime concern of the department. For example, suppose you invent a, a widget with two handles instead of one. Well, this means, of course, a big boon to widget users because it can now be operated by left-handed as well as right-handed people. Having invented a two-handled widget, you and your inventive genius should be protected. So you contact the Commerce Department and apply for a patent. The department also registers the trademarks and labels you use in selling two-handled widgets so that no one else can claim he invented the two-handled widget and collect the money that should be rightfully yours when you make and sell your particular type of widget. Now, suppose you also write a book on the history of the two-handled widget or a song titled The Love Song of the Two-Handled Widget. You take them to the Department of Commerce and have them copyrighted. This way, you can always prove that the book and the song are your property. So if some foreign inventor suddenly appears with the startling announcement that his country claims the honor of having invented the two-handled widget or the one-wheel doohickey, you can prove he is mistaken by producing the prior patent you have registered with the United States Department of Commerce. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Plymouth Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Paul Garrell matter. Expense account item one, $153. Airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Phoenix, Arizona. On the way from my hotel to the Plymouth offices, I noticed that the afternoon papers were front-paging a report of the local killing of an, of an unidentified man. I learned shortly afterward that the murder had an important bearing on my own foreseeable future. The story about it was displayed prominently on the desk of George Post, Plymouth's chief adjuster in Phoenix, when I got to his office. You say that all you know of this case is what you read in the Eastern papers? Yeah, that's right, and as you probably know, there weren't many details. Yes, being that far removed, of course. Here, it's been the worst crime in years. The killing of the two guards was needless. They weren't putting up a fight? No. They've been disarmed with standing with their backs to the killer. They were shot down because they were potential identifying witnesses. Nobody else saw it? Yeah. The story in the lower right-hand corner. Oh, yeah, I saw the headlines on the way over. What about it? This uh, picture here of the dead man, Palavik. He was the only other witness. And the paper doesn't say anything about it? The papers don't know it, and the police don't know it. There were two men involved in the robbery. Palavik was one of them. Well, you must have some big reason to hold this kind of information from the police. I have. Palavik phoned me the morning after the robbery, and I met with him in secret that afternoon. He told me that he'd broken off with his partner in the affair, a man using the name of Paul Garrell. He said there'd been an agreement between them that there'd be no shooting. But that in spite of it, Garrell shot the guards down in cold blood. 
Well, did you ask him why he didn't go to the police if he was so interested in clearing himself of the killings? He said he was on parole, would face an automatic 20-year term if he went to them. What did he expect from you? Mm, nothing. He said he'd been in trouble with the law most of his life, but that he'd never killed anybody. He claimed that all he wanted was to stop Gorell from enjoying what he termed that blood money. He told me where Gorell is and what his plans are. Is Gorell still in Phoenix? Yes. And I know what you're going to say. That you still think it's a job for the police. Well, with three murders to his credit, I sure do. We decided to try it our way because their plan was to mail the money out of the state. Palavik was sure that Gorell has already sent it. But didn't know where, except that it was someplace in or near Los Angeles. Uh-huh. Any idea how he's going to try to get out of town? Yeah. It's one of those share-the-ride arrangements. You know, the kind that are advertised in the classified sections. This man is driving to Los Angeles and wanted passengers to share the expense and help with the driver. Both of them are going in the same car? Yeah. And since Palavik isn't going, there's room for me, huh? <laughs> That's what I meant when I mentioned you're taking a gamble. There's no doubt that Gorell is a completely ruthless killer. Now, will you go? Well, I don't like it for a lot of obvious reasons. But I wouldn't like a reputation for turning down cases, either. When do I leave? I understood why the company didn't want to involve the police. In their opinion, the chances were that more effort would be spent in apprehending the killer than in tracing down the money. But a big insurance company is one thing, and a private investigator working behind the law's back is another. And that was one thing I didn't like about the matter. Another that rang a little sour was Gorell's choice of getaway method. The police admittedly had no witnesses and therefore no description. Yet Gorell was avoiding public transportation. It made me wonder if somebody else could be looking for him. And still another thing. Gorell would be in control of the situation. I wouldn't. I couldn't even afford the luxury of a gun for fear the bulge would arouse suspicion. The owner of the car for the trip was a Mr. Bovey, and I phoned him from post office. You couldn't have read it in today's paper, Mr. Dollar. I canceled my ad last evening. Well, I clipped the ad a day or so ago when it wasn't definite about my going to the coast. I hope you have room for me. Well, I, I'm afraid I don't. I already have two gentlemen and a lady. Well, but it's a sedan, isn't it? Five passenger? Yes, but five is too many. Uncomfortable for my people. You're uh, sure that all your people are still going? I haven't heard to the contrary. Well, you can't tell about people. Suppose we leave it this way. I'll come out to your house in the morning. If there's room for me, I'll go. If there isn't, I won't. Is that okay? Well, if you want to take a chance, but don't expect to crowd in, I know from experience five is too many. All right, Mr. Bovey. I'll see you in the morning, then. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. I suppose that was the only way to handle it. Uh, but how is Gorell going to react to your being there? No, I don't think it'll change things. A guy in his spot is going to be suspicious of everybody anyway. At nine the next morning, I arrived at Bovey's address in a Phoenix suburb. He left me in a seedy living room while he put his luggage in a car that was parked at the curb in front of the house. And a minute after he came back in, the doorbell rang and he let Gorell in. Just leave your luggage by the door, Mr. Gorell. Your friend, he's not with you. Father came up. Some business deal, so he couldn't come. But why didn't he let me know? Yes, he figured I would, because I made all the arrangements with you. And all the time I thought he'd call. Well, Mr. Dollar, did you hear that? Yeah, looks like I'm in luck. Uh, uh, this is Mr. Gorell. How are you? Hi, how are you? Uh, Mr. Dollar came this morning just on the chance that this might happen, so there'd be room for him. What, that somebody wouldn't show up? <laughs> must be psychic or something. Oh, no. Guy's got to get the brakes once in a while. Uh, well, you two get acquainted while I pack the luggage. You, uh, live here in Phoenix? No, I'm from the east. Connecticut. To travel all the way out here this way? I mean, in people's cars like this? Not uh, all the way. Hmm. I think I'll go outside and see what's going on. I don't want Bobby scratching my bag up. Nothing except two cold blue eyes that moved around too much would have given him away for what he was. The rest of his makeup, thin triangular face, blonde hair, and slightly stooped figure would have made him unnoticed in any company. 
By the time I followed him outside, the fourth member of our party had arrived. She was a not unattractive brunette wearing Harlequin sunglasses that made her look frightened. I wondered how she'd look if she knew who her traveling companions were. This is Miss Shelton and Mr. Dollar. Miss Shelton? Hi. We're all loaded. All right, then we're ready. Now, how shall we arrange how you sit? Does anyone care? Yeah, uh, how about I take my turn driving first? I drove a cab for a while, and I know some quick ways out of town. Well, that, that's fine. Miss Shelton, will you sit in the back with Mr. Dollar? I, I like to ride in front in my own car. It's all right with me. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. The starter's right there, Mr. Gorell. Yeah, I got it. Well, now, I'd say we got a nice early start. Which way are you going, Mr. Gorell? North on Mission Drive? That's right. I turn off on North and hit the highway. It's that long stretch of traffic out towards Peoria. Yes, but now, this is out of the way. It just seems like it. You leave it to me. I know this town like a book. Whether Gorell was missing some roadblocks that I knew nothing about, I couldn't be sure. But I wasn't sure his back road way out of town was working either. As we pulled away from Bovey's house, I glanced up the block and saw a green coupe nose into the street behind us. You know this neighborhood, Dollar? No, never been through it. Why? The way you were looking around, because you were trying to spot an old landmark or something. Well, just trying to memorize my way back in case you get lost. You don't trust me? You want I should pull over so you can drive? Please, Mr. Gorell, he didn't mean anything like that. He was only making a joke. What's the matter with him to get sore about a thing like that? What did you say, lady? I didn't quite catch it. You weren't supposed to catch it. I must say, this trip is off to a dandy start with you snapping everybody's head off. Please, please, please. There's no reason for it to be unpleasant. We've got a long way to go. That evening, with Bovey driving... We were approaching Blythe on the California border when the car began to heat up. By the time we found a garage on the outskirts of town, it was almost dark. The report from the mechanic was that the water pump had gone, but he couldn't get a replacement until morning. I expected an outburst from Gorell because of the delay, and I was surprised at his reaction to Bovey's apology. I, I just don't know what to say. I had the car gone over yesterday, and they told me everything was fine. It's not your fault, Mr. Bovey. Nobody could see inside that pump. Oh, but I'm so sorry about the delay. Nobody's worried about me. For me, I'm glad it happened. I had enough of the road. And I could use a good night's sleep. Well, I, I don't feel so bad then. The mechanic said the motor court in the next block is a nice place. Shall we go look at it? Why not? Hey, well. All right, come along then. Wait a minute. Wait, what's the matter? Mr. Gorell. Make it on the inside. I can't let them see me. He wanted to run as the green coupe slowly came abreast of us, but he didn't. I expected gunfire, but none came. Only the beam of a flashlight that held briefly on Gorell and then snapped off. I spotted two men in the coupe as it rolled away from us. Then I turned with Bovey and the girl to see how Gorell would explain himself. Sorry. I thought it was somebody I knew. Somebody I... Didn't feel like talking to just now. He didn't realize how lame the excuse was. I didn't think the others saw it, but from where I stood, I watched his hands streak for the automatic he wore under his arm. It was an instinctive move that he wasn't even aware of making. But from a man who had been relaxed and confident of a getaway, he'd turned back into an unpredictable killer. How many great men have attained the highest office in our land? The Presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? The Presidency was the first and only public office he ever held. He never went to school, but was taught at home by a tutor. Like his father, he also became a military man and remained in the service until his nomination to the Presidency in 1848. He was the second and last member of the Whig Party to become president. 
If you don't have his name by now, here's another clue. During his presidency, gold was discovered in California. Who was he? Zachary Taylor, 12th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I wanted to report the whole thing to the local police. If I had, I might have prevented a lot of trouble. But I didn't. We checked into the motor court, and about 20 minutes later, Garrell showed up at my room. Has Wolfie been to see you? Why, no. The Dane? No. I figured they might on account of that performance I put on out there. If the truth is, I, uh, I got in some trouble in Phoenix, and uh, my, my nerves aren't so good. That's okay. I'm not curious. Yeah, well, I, I didn't want you to think I'm nuts or anything like that. I, I thought maybe you could tell the others. I, I wouldn't want Bobby to dump me out of the trip. I haven't got enough to get to L.A. any other way. But look at this wallet. See? A single and one pin. That's my stake. Mm, that's running pretty close. I wish I could help you out. No, but... no, I'm not making a touch. I can scrape up some when I hit L.A., but... Uh, well, I, I'd like it if you told the others. It's up to you. Yeah, you see, I uh, got into a card game with these two guys in Phoenix. I was drinking. I thought the stakes got higher than I should have, and I lost more than I could pay. So, uh, I... Ran out on them. Those were the men that drove by? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were. Well, if they followed you this far, don't you think they'll follow you the rest of the way? I don't know. Say, uh, you got uh, anything lined up out there? Oh, nothing definite. Why? Well, if they're still on me, maybe I could use some help getting things uh, straightened out, you know? I'd uh, make it worth your while. What kind of help? I will see how things stack up when we get there. <laughs> Anybody that travels like this could use a few extra bucks. You can't get me there. Yeah, that's right. Okay. You tell both you and the dame what I said. And then maybe you and me can give each other a hand. Maybe. Well, I'll see you in the morning. I hear we're going to get an early start. about 4 p.m. when the share of the ride trip ended on a street corner in downtown Los Angeles. Bovey drove away, the Shelton girl disappeared in the crowds, and Garrell and I took a cab. The Twins Hotel on Spring Street. Right, get in, Dollar. Uh, here's how it is. Before I left Phoenix, I shipped some of my stuff. Clothes, personal papers, and some cash that I didn't want to carry. You know, you can't tell what kind of people you're going to run into, travel and share the ride like we did. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's right. Now, you see, if I get that suitcase, I can pay off. And, and these guys will have to leave me alone. But uh, the way things are, I got an idea they'd beat my head off if they caught up with me. So it would uh, be worth uh, 25 bucks if you go get that suitcase and bring it to me. Oh, that sounds simple enough. I figured his pitch was based on desperation rather than stupidity. He knew he was still being followed or... He never would have trusted a stranger with $100,000 that had already been worth three killings. And his letting me get this close to it made me wonder whether the fourth killing wasn't already in his mind. We both checked into the Prince Hotel, and in his room, he gave me the express receipt I'd need to pick up the suitcase. I left him and made my first stop at a phone booth. I called the police, told them my story, and arranged to meet a plainclothes sergeant from Homicide a block away from the express office. Your name Dollar? That's right. I'm Sergeant Mason. I don't know what to make of the story of yours. Well, that's just why I asked if you could meet me. I want you on hand when I deliver that suitcase. How come you didn't check with the Phoenix boys before you left? Would you like to stick your neck out, or you got some other reason? I told the lieutenant it was the company's idea, not mine. Ah. Uh -huh. You got some identification? Yeah. Uh, here you are. Hmm. Yeah, okay, darling. But I don't go for you private boys to play at Lone Wolf till it gets too hot and then yell for us. I'll go along because I've been ordered to. 
but don't think I'm eager. Hmm. I gathered that. I took delivery of the suitcase without a hitch. Sergeant Mason was waiting halfway down the block when I came out with it. He trailed me back to the Prince Hotel and waited while I went ahead into the lobby. I got to Garrell's floor, and when the sergeant was a few steps behind me, knocked on the door. Garrell? Garrell? It's Dollar. Try the door. I'll take a look in there. Well, his stuff's still here. There's no sign of a struggle. No sign of anything. Do you have any idea how empty the story of yours sounds, Don? Yeah, yeah, I suppose it does. But how about coming to my room? We'll get this suitcase open. No, not with me there. If you'd played it level with the Phoenix police and we had a go-ahead from them, yes. I've got no right to break into somebody's personal property on your say-so. You're leaving? That's right. And if your story's true, I feel sorry for you. I'd hate to be playing it alone. But officially, you've given me nothing but a trip across town and some talk. i got to have witnesses and evidence to work with. If you come up with some, just call the department. I hope the company will remember Sergeant Mason's procedure the next time there's a choice between working with the police or without them. He had every right to walk out, and when he did, this is what he left me with. A, the obvious possibilities involving the suitcase and whoever was after it, and B, the fact that returning to Phoenix with the money and without Garrell would put me in the light of aiding and abetting the escape of a murderer. It was then 6 o'clock. I checked Garrell's suitcase at a bus station a short distance away. Then I grabbed a quick sandwich and went back to my room to wait. At a quarter of eight, there was a knock on my door. Aren't you going to invite me in? Oh, oh, sure. Sorry. You knocked me off balance a little. Come on in, Miss Sheldon. Thank you. I, uh... I don't suppose there'd be a chance that you'd just listen to me without asking any questions and then do what I tell you to. What would you tell me to do? Pack up and get out of here. Out of town would be better. Why? Because without knowing it, you've got yourself mixed up with some bad people. Who do you mean, Garrell? Yeah. What about him? I didn't realize you knew him. I don't. I mean, I didn't. Look, you have to ask questions. Well, I'm sure not going to pack up and move out of here just because you show up with some crazy talk about bad people. Well, it's true. Garrell was trying to use you to save his own skin. Did you go after a suitcase for him? Yeah, but I didn't get it to him. He wasn't in his room when I got back. I know that. Some men came after him. The same ones that we saw in Blythe. They might have killed him by now. And they're liable to kill you, too. Where did you get all this? Just believe me that it's true and get out of here. I can't say any... Please. I'll be right there. You get in there. Yes. What happened to you? Got away from came for my suitcase. Good. Wait. Is he dead? No, not yet. Get my coat off the bed so I can stretch him out. Well, maybe you'll believe me. I gotta get out of here. Oh, no, you don't. Look, I didn't have to come here to warn you. I was trying to do you a favor. Is this what I get for it? I'm sorry, but I can't let you go. Not with a man dying of gunshot wounds in my room. I've got to have some answers for the police. And it looks like you're the only one who can give them to me. I was roped into it like you. I didn't know what it was all about. But you do now? Yeah, and I don't want any part of it. Two guys I knew in Phoenix paid me $200 to take the trip from Phoenix and follow Gorilla when we got here. I was broke, and they said it was only a gag of some kind, so I took him up on it. Those are the two guys in the coupe? Yeah. Then when they got to Garrell tonight, and I heard them talking about robbery and killing, it began to catch on. They were the ones that pulled that payroll robbery in Phoenix. You didn't know till then? I sure didn't. 
Look, I'm no angel, but I'd never have anything to do with this kind of business. Now, what's the rest of it? Well, there were four of them that planned it. But Garrell tried to get away with the money by himself. They, they mentioned something about a phone call from somebody named uh, Kolavik. Well, that's all I know. Uh-huh. When they had Garrell tonight, they were trying to find out where the suitcase was? Yeah, that's right. They were hitting him and saying they'd kill him. But all he'd say was that somebody else had it. I figured it was you, and that's why I came. I tried to help you. Now, how about it? Can I go? Yeah. And you'd better take the same advice you gave me. Go and keep going. You know too much about this mess. After she left, I called Sergeant Mason in the emergency hospital. Garrell was still unconscious when I opened the door about 15 minutes later. I assumed it would be Mason, but it wasn't. Back in the room, Dollar. I've got you. Is he dead? He's close to it. Did that uh, automatic put him where he is? Stay out of what's none of your business and you won't get some of the same. Garrell made it my business. He talked before he passed out. That's too bad. Did he tell you he chalked up another killing to his credit tonight? Oh, I guess he forgot that. The one who came with you from Phoenix? A friend of mine. Oh. I've lost two of them over this, so don't you try to play it smart. Uh, uh, you know what I'm here for. You can look the place over. You won't find the suitcase. You picked it up. Where is it? Look in the top right drawer of the bureau. Hmm. Why? Go ahead. You'll find a claim check in there. Nobody can get the suitcase without it. Mm -hmm. This don't say where it is. Where did you leave it? It's in a bus station. If you leave by the rear door, you go down the alley. To... You keep quiet. by this, and I hope you will. What? No matter what side of the law you're on, don't pay to play at lone wolf like he was and like you were. Level with the police next time, huh? Yeah, I'll remember that. Expense account item two, $63.80. Miscellaneous between Los Angeles and Phoenix. Item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $369.80. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.